Good evening, everybody. Hi. So good to see you all here. I'm Amy Dunham Strand, director of the Jane Hibbert Idaho Women's Studies Center here at Aquinas. And on behalf of Women's Studies and the Contemporary Writers Series, I'm delighted to welcome you to our reading with contemporary writer Desiree Cooper. Please take this moment to turn off your cell phones if you have not done so already. I'm honored to welcome you to Desiree Cooper's reading tonight, for Cooper herself is an award-winning writer, among, uh, among others, a Michigan Notable Book winner, a Kresge Artist Fellow, and a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist. Yet Cooper is also an award-winning company as part of our two unique initiatives. The Contemporary Writers Series engages Aquinas and West Michigan contemporary poets and writers, including, for example, past notables like Seamus Haney and Joy Harjo, as well as spoken word poet Sarah Kay just a couple of years ago and just in September, Brendan Kiley. The Jane Hibbert Idaho Women's Studies Center serves as a community resource for women's and gender issues to empower students to advocate for gender equality and social justice. The Women's Studies Center has hosted, among others, New York Times journalist Nicholas Kristoff, Native American activist Winona LaDuke, Georgetown historian Marsha Chatlin, and astrophysicist Jedida Eisler. Please check our respective web websites for our notable spring guests uh, coming up, Michigan poet Allison Swan and uh, National Book Award finalist Arlie Hawkschild this spring. But tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing Desiree Cooper's work, her compelling, thoughtful words. To introduce Desiree Cooper, please help me welcome Aquinas English major and Women's Studies minor, Junior Bridget Gibley. Thanks. Um, I am so honored to be introducing Desiree Cooper tonight as an English major and a women's studies minor, as she said, um, as well as an intern for the Jane Hibbert Idaho Women's Studies Center. Cooper's writing on racial and gender equality is right at the intersection of my interests and my studies. Cooper has been published in Hypertext Review, The Best Small Fictions 2018, This Is the Place, Michigan Quarterly Review, and Best African American Fiction 2010, among many others. Her writing touches on everything from the intersectionality of racism and sexism to the welfare of women and girls to self-care and reinvention. Cooper's recent collection of flash fiction, Know the Mother, is a wide-ranging exploration of the idea of motherhood in its many stages. In these little snapshots of women, from those just finding out they are pregnant to women caring for aging mothers, Cooper quilts together the myriad of issues facing women as they move throughout life. I have always been amazed by people who can write short pieces well. Desiree Cooper introduces her characters, explains the situation, and gets to the heart of the issue, all in just a few pages. I have been thinking about some of her one-page stories nonstop since I've read them. But I think one of the most memorable lines from Know the Mother for me was the last line of, my, of the acknowledgments. Cooper writes, to all the women whose stories are never told, I honor your sacrifice with my words. Literature is all about getting to know other people through words. So it is especially important that Desiree Cooper focuses on those who might not get to tell their story or might not get to tell this particular story. She emphasizes the uncomfortable moments in life, unflinchingly aware of all their complexities. By drawing attention to those stories we might not normally hear, Desiree Cooper achieves what all good literature tries to do, to explore the human condition and teach us something new. Please join me in welcoming Desiree Cooper. Thank you, Bridget. That was awesome. Can you guys hear me? This is the first time I've had a Janet Jackson mic. You can see it because it doesn't match my skin tone, um, <laughs> which is a fun fact. They come in different colors. Like I never thought about that until tonight. Um, I want to thank you guys for, for having me here. I have done nothing but eat for a day and a half, and I've had excellent, excellent food. Um, and I want to thank Linda for, for setting up this series and for me being part of that amazing legacy of writers who have come before. Um, and I'm really honored just to be here with you guys. Um, I have done a lot of talking around this book over the past two and a half years. And um, nothing is more engaging and more fun and more interesting and more educational for me than being on campuses. Um, I think that 
students bring a special um, curiosity to the page. And also they're not allowed to explore um, what is evoked by them when they read, which is lucky for me because I like to do what I call instant book clubs. So because I'm a flash fiction writer, I can read a whole story to you in a minute or so, and we're all on the same page at that point, literally and figuratively, and then we can all discuss the story together. So that's what we're gonna do. And I'm not gonna just stand right here. And if you have a question or reaction, I expect to hear from you. And I learn as much as you learn through this interaction. So here's the deal, flash fiction. Flash fiction is usually defined as uh, fiction stories that are a thousand words or less. I spent a lot of my time as a professional writer, as a columnist in the newspaper. And I was confined to 750 words or less. So when I finally had the time to go from journalism to creative writing, I found that after 11 years of writing 750 words or less, no matter how much time I put in a story and how much research, um, I couldn't write longer than that. So people ask, how do you write short? And I'm like, well, how do you write long? I, like, I don't know how to do that. And so I also say, um, if there wasn't flash fiction, I would have had to invent it. Um, so that's the story of my stories. Now, flash meets you at a certain place, assuming we all have a basic common experience, takes you through a character or a moment, and then lets you go and then the story is yours. What happens next? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Um, do they win or do they lose? Is all your story. And that's where I like to hear what you think. How did the story resonate with you? And the themes I deal with, you know, mother is a big word. It might not even be a word you're particularly interested in talking about. Um, however, we've all had them. Some of us are going to be them. Some of us have uh, siblings. Some of us have been daughters. And so we've all related to mother in some way, shape, or form. And it's mostly around a gender norm, a gender constraint, an ideal. And so my book is about how do women, real women, relate to that ideal? of mother, which is a big, 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 big mantle. You know, it's an archetype that overshadows what the human being really is. So I'm going to start with the story that um, is called Ceiling. Uh, and you will know why soon. Or maybe we'll talk about why. Um, and um, you will hear my close proximity to poetry. Because if you're going to write short, you've got to use a lot of tools of poets to compress. So it's going to sound like poetry, because it is, but the line breaks are different, so we're not calling it that. Um, and in this story, what I am trying to do is take the experience of one woman and have it stand for women globally. So let's see if that happens and what it evokes for you. So am I allowed to move? Am I doing OK over here? OK. So ceiling. The law firm was no place for a woman, law review or otherwise. Do you know what law review is? It's like uh, the, um, the top 1% of people in your law school, the academically talented. So I'll start over. The law firm was no place for a woman, law review or otherwise. He said as much sucking the end of his pipe, eyes gazing past his glasses to her tender breasts. She tried not to shrivel beneath his stare. She felt faint, like a rice patty woman bent in muddy water as a baby hardened in her womb. Maternity leave, he repeated, considering her quietly a problem to be solved. Pipe smoke curled to the ceiling, a halo of power. His tie was burka blue and lemon yellow, a robin's egg cracked open, yolk running. He leaned forward and knocked his pipe on the crystal ashtray, filling the room with the linger of fire. 
She was nothing more than a useless bride, cross legs as brown as firewood, ready to be doused, life going up in saffron flames. If you wanted to have babies, he said, smiling gently, why did you go to law school? So what's your immediate reaction to this story? Anybody? If you're going to, you can shout out one word, and that's good. But if you're going to say something more than that, we need you to be mic'd. So, shout outs? I want to slap him. You want to slap him? Wow. Okay. Right out the gates. <laughs> An SOB right here in the front. I'd like to fire him. You'd like to fire him. Okay. What else is going on in the story? So, so this woman is sitting in a senior partner's office in a law firm, right? Um, clearly broaching the topic that at some point she's going to take time off to have a baby. Um, what is the relative power in this, between the characters in this story? OK, I am not a teacher, <laughs> but I have been a parent. I still am. My baby's 31. He doesn't listen to me either. But I will be quiet and wait for someone to say something. I'm not afraid of silence. So talk to me a little bit about the relative power of the characters in the story. Who do we have? So, so the senior partner has the power to hire and fire. Mm -hmm. This woman has extraordinary courage to basically say, I want to come back to this firm, but I need time off. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is there's a short-term view, which is, uh, what did you do for me this year, this quarter, this month? And then there's long-term view, which is, do I want you here for 30 years? And this is a blip that is very doable in the course of 30 years. Well, see, now this is exactly what I mean by flash. That is the whole rest of the story, right? We're, we're out 30 years from this moment, um, which I love, you know, because that is a, that's a question that it raises. Is this woman going to be successful in this environment or not, right? And whether or not it's a blip, it could be pivotal, right? It could be a quick moment, but it could be a pivotal moment, depending on what happens next. So what are going to be some of the de determining factors of her success in this firm after this moment? Ideas? Shout out anything. Strong enough to fight him or even to come back, you know, to come back. Is she welcome here or not? Does she, do you think she's welcome here? Does she feel welcome here? How do you know? How do you know? She's the last sentence, which <laughs> if you wanted to have babies, this is, this is a big hint, isn't it? If you wanted to have babies, why did you go to law school? That, that is a pretty big hint that she's not welcome. But she is welcome if she doesn't have babies, right? So this is what I talk about, um, some of the norms that, that really wrap around the idea of mother, because there's a double vulnerability. If she was a law review student with power because she's, she's been hired into this high power law firm, she's in the top of her class, she has options. And she got an education. So she's got some sort of, um, power might be a, a strong word, but she has definitely has choices, right? Um, but it seems to me that one of her choices is, if you want to stay here, don't have babies. And do men have to make those kinds of choices? So there's a double vulnerability for women for themselves and their own success. And then there's a second one of the safety and welfare of the child. Does she feel like she needs to be there in order to provide the kind of life that she wants to give for her children? or? to be the person she wants to be. She might want to be on the Supreme Court one day. She can't do that at home. She's got to practice law. Now, there's some language in this story that doesn't seem to belong there. 
like, I'm going to read, it's very short, it's one page. So I'm going to read some of the uh, phrases. For example, she felt faint, like a rice paddy woman bent in muddy water as a baby hardened in her womb. His tie was burqa blue. What's a burqa? Anyone know what a burqa is? Someone shout it out for the rest of us. It's the covering, um, especially full body. And it's that robin's egg bright blue. You saw it on, on uh, women af in Afghanistan, especially when the war broke out. And there's nothing, the face is completely veiled and there's like a screen where they can look through. So his tie is that color, burqa blue and lemon yellow. He leaned forward and knocked his pipe on the crystal ashtray, filling the room with the linger of fire. She was nothing more than a useless bride, cross legs as brown as firewood, ready to be doused, life going up in saffron flames. What's that a reference to? We might need a mic on this. Up front, sorry. Indian burning of the wives when the husband dies. You Did you that? hear it? <laughs> Future boys hear yeah, the bride burning um, in India, which is not as prevalent, but there was a time when women were either thrown on the funeral pyres of their husbands or through themselves because there was no place in society for a widow. There was no one that could take care of them. So what are all these images doing in this law firm office? Hold on, Linda, hold on. It's a very menacing uh, aura that mm -hmm. we are given. Uh, it's not comforting for this woman who definitely there's a seesaw of power from the get-go, but there are um, very subtle, uh, the fire, the, uh, the smoke, there are menacing images mm -hmm. that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else? That's really interesting. Extra thing you can throw away and get another Women one. Women are, th are throwaways. And it's also a, um, an odd kind of shout out to global, the global um, state of womanhood. That certainly if this woman whose race is not identified at all in the story, and she's nameless in the story, but she certainly has privilege and she's in a place of power and has achieved that. And she's young enough to still have children. So she's, it hasn't taken a lifetime for her to climb to this lofty level. And yet in this, mo in this moment, she is facing what women globally who have far less power and far less access are facing with doors closing, um, particularly around their status as mothers. So that's why I call it ceiling. It's the glass ceiling, right, in a different way. Any other comments about that one? Anybody hate that story and would like to just talk about why? You can do that. It's happened before, hasn't it? <laughs> OK, so um, now I'm going to read one that talks about another aspect of gender. Um, this, this story is called To the Bone. Um, and it's, for those of you who have a book, it's on page 107. I saw some of you reading along. <laughs> you don't have to do that, though. OK, to the bone. Daily, a piece of crackling bread, a bowl of bo boiled turnips, fried fat back. Pa and the boys would get extra pieces of the salty meat whenever there was any to be had. They worked at the mill. They needed their strength. Sometimes Pa would save the tough meat rinds and sneak them to me before he left for work. Whenever I'd feel faint while boiling shirts, I'd stick a piece in my mouth, letting that smoky flavor of his kindness just fill me up. I learned early how to live on bone and gristle. At least I got to suck the marrow of bones and gnaw on the juicy gristle. Aletha Ruffin was so skinny her cheeks sunk in where her teeth used to be. 
They called her chicken legs. Her hair was a thin nest of wire and husk. When she smiled, you thought death was coming. One day, Mama sent me to school with a buttermilk biscuit that was stuffed with pear preserves, and Aletha let the waters of her mouth run, just like a dog waiting for scraps at the back door. What could I do but give it to her? She grabbed the biscuit and without a thank you and never looked me in the eye again. They say the county came and took away the roughened children, but sometimes I wonder if they just dwindled down to nothing and disappeared. There was always something to keep from dwindling, dwindling down to nothing. Eat from the root, savor the skins, feast on gizzards, tongues, and hearts. Sop your bread and pot liquor. Scrape crackling from the pan to make the gravy taste like a meal. Lard your belly. Trade a dime for a pickle so sour it will lock your jaws. When your eyes start to sparkle and your hips round out, sway sweetly in front of a man like a ripened berry ready to be plucked. The blackberries were ripe for the plucking the summer I swayed in front of Thalius Jones. In the back of his uncle's pickup, he sunk his teeth into my tender flesh, gripped the rounds of my hips. Girl, you give a man something to hold on to, he said. That Christmas, he brought Mama two bright oranges and Pa a bunch of raisins still on the vine. We got married in the spring. When I sat at the table with failures, he spooned his turnips into my bowl. Eat up, he said. I'm going to have me a big fat baby. Well, Tessie was a big fat baby. Everywhere we went, folks would draw in a breath and say, Woo, wee, look at that girl. I'd shine her up with Vaseline, gather her thick hair in a bow, and parade her at the five and dime. I walked one-sided with her on my hip. When Thalius would come home in the evenings from the post office, the kitchen would be heavy with the smell of pork chops and onions. He'd holler, where's my big bone girls? Until the day that she grew up and got married, Tessie would always run to him first. He'd take her moon face with both hands, let his thumbs run over her velvet skin, and tell her that she was the prettiest girl in the world. My granddaughter Madison has the velvety complexion that her mom always had, a face as wide and self-satisfied as the moon's. She used to let me pinch her delicious thighs, and she'd blush when Thalia's called her pork pie. But now Madison is 13 and growing up. She gets mad at the things that used to make her smile. Last week, I took her school shopping for a pair of those jeans that fit like the skin of an onion. <laughs> the lady in the store frowned and said, we don't carry those large sizes here, sweetie. The moon went into shadow, and I couldn't cheer Madison up, even with a bowl of haagen -Dazs. The moon is shadowed by evening clouds as I set, the bowl in front of, set my bowl of home cooking in front of Madison. At 16, she is now so thin, I worry how she will ever become a blackberry ripe for picking. Eat, I say, spooning Madison more food. She eyes my prosperous waist. No thanks, Nanny, she replies politely. Her eyes have no sparkle, like the eyes of the alabaster girls in the magazines. She pushes around the food that I've cooked for her, but I eat without shame, braised turnips, ham, and crackling bread. Reactions? What does the story bring up for you? The beauty ideal. The beauty ideal. Perfection. The body perfect for women, right? What is the difference between the ideal of beauty from the grandmother to the granddaughter? And there's actually three generations in this, in this piece. It's a different universe. It's a different universe. What's the biggest difference? How about someone over here? I haven't attacked this side of the room yet. Economics. Can we, we need a mic over here. I want you to say more about that. So economics was the biggest difference between the generations? Yeah, 
Yes. So the grandmother. The, can you guys hear her? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. It's Mike. <laughs> can you hear me? <clears throat> if you don't, if you didn't have enough to eat, if you couldn't afford to have enough to eat, then then showing that you had an, it showed on you if you had mm -hmm. if you had extra. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say it like that. So, did you guys hear her? Yeah, it shows up. Your money shows up on you, right? right. So, so nowadays, I mean, I guess it always has. But there was a time where if you had little, you were little, <laughs> right? And if you had a lot, you were bigger. Because you could now it's almost flipped, isn't it? Right. I hadn't thought about that. Um, where now the more you have, the smaller you look and the more um, it's like the less you are from your natural self. And the less you have, the less access you have to what is healthy and your body might might not be in a healthy state. At that point, it's interesting how that's flipped like that. Yeah, were you going to say something? There's also the difference between what you're supposed to look like to have like a woman's body that can give birth mm -hmm. that has curves, mm -hmm. but then there's the ideal that you have like a woman has to be small and tiny, and it, she's not supposed to take up space. Right. So there's that contrast too, because the grandmother is like thinking about the body she's supposed to have for her to have children but the granddaughter's thinking about what she's supposed to have for society at that time in her life. Right. Exactly. The norms have changed. And it does have to do with age, and it does have to do with class and economics. Because, I mean, think about the kinds of things that the grandmother was eating. It's called eating low on the hog, right? You're eating, you know, the gizzards and the hearts and the, you know, it's, it's gravy and onions and... Um, and root vegetables, and these are things that were plentiful and easy and cheap. Um, and as you get older, you push those, those kinds of foods aside. Um, and it's an economic decision, you know, how you eat and what class you're representing by your food. When I was little, my mother, um, my grandmother, used to call everyone fat. And it was really, honest to God, it was a compliment. She'd go, baby, you're so fat. And I couldn't, when baby fat jeans, do you guys remember baby fat jeans? There was jeans called baby fat, and it was spelled P-H-A-T. And I had to laugh when that came out, because like, what a joke on American culture that was, to market these skinny, teeny, weeny jeans to girls everywhere and call them baby fat coming out of a culture where baby fat where fatness is valued not devalued i mean that's like irony upon irony that i don't think people really talked about much um and if my dad called me skinny he used to call me skinny mini i would break down in tears that was the most horrific thing Fast forward, my mother, raised by the grandmother who called everybody fat, started calling me fat every time she saw me. And it just got to the point where I'm just like, I'm going to punch her the next time she says that. Like, why does she keep saying that? And she thought I was getting like this attitude. Like, what's wrong with you? All I did was say that you were fat. And I'm like, what? You said it again, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's very interesting how the further away you get from um, either culturally, typically African Americans ha have not had the same kind of relationship to body image. That is not true anymore. Uh, and typically men did not. And now they're all bulimics <laughs> and all anorexics. It's, it's pretty much permeated society. Um, and so that's definitely um, another aspect of gender. Um, that I wanted to bring to the fore in this. Any other questions or? Did, let's. I just think the way that you described food in this story 
Hold on one second. Question. I just think the way that you describe food as part of joy and love in this story really highlights how sad it is that they can't share in that love together. Right. Yeah. You do a really great job of framing it that way. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's this, that's another archetype of mother is like the hearth and the kitchen, you know, um, and mothers telling their daughters that you're not going to find a mate unless you can cook. And, and wives learning husbands, you know, favorite meals from their mothers so that their men will be happy. Like, this is a big deal. And once that got interrupted, um, then that idea of mother as hearth and, and kitchen has also been really interrupted. It's, you know, sometimes it's a question of what have we gained and what have we lost? I mean, I would love for it to be the father hearth in the kitchen. That would be my... Um, but instead, it's father barbecue, which is not correlative. Like, barbecuing is playing outside while the meat cooks. That's different. Um, but anyway, yeah, when you, certainly when you interrupt um, these norms, the ripples happen. And for better or worse, things are different. Um, so I want to. Um, I think I'm going to not do, how much more time do I have? Somebody help me. When am I supposed to be done? What time? Uh, I love you. I love you. 8.30, was that the answer? Okay. All right. That helps me. Okay. So I'm not going by my, um, let's do something surreal. Yeah, let's do something surreal. So I'm going to do one called Soft Landing. It just has a little different tone than some of the others. Um, it's on page 77. Um, and question, how many of you guys dream about flying, have a recurring dream about flying? What? This is a very higher so I can see you. I'm not going to call on you. I lied, I am. OK, so this is a pretty. Um, common recurring dream that people have. And it's like the test dream or um, falling dreams that people have. Um, so for those of you who have a flying dream, can someone describe to me their, what, what it is, what it feels like, what happens in their dream? Who wants to do that? Just tell me about their recurring dream. Um, when I have my flying dream, it's never one of fear. Uh -huh. I'm never afraid that I'm going to fall. And it's like I'm swimming in the air. I'm way above and I'm just going like this, you know, hello, and uh, have no fear of falling. Uh -huh. uh, I'm looking around. I'm noticing things under, you know, below me. But uh, it's a very uh, peaceful, peaceful kind of cool. feeling. Mm -hmm. And how do you get into the air? Uh, I'm just in the air. You just, so, I, I, you're I just, just right up I'm there. Right, right up there. Okay. I, I don't like whoosh, go up uh -huh. and jump up. Uh, the, the dream starts and there I am, either on the ceiling uh -huh. or in the sky. Yeah, I'm already there. But I love the idea of like I'm swimming, swimming. in the water because I'm not a good swimmer in the water, but uh -huh. it's like I'm swimming in the air. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Who else? Who I else just jump got? and jump and jump and jump. And every time I jump, I'm jumping a little higher until I'm in the air. And then I, away I go. Oh. So I jump a little. Is it and, scary? Oh, not at all. Not at it's all. It's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Flying dreams are wonderful. Who else? Who else wants to tell me, especially if it's different from these two in, in some way? I saw more hands. I could point to people, but I'm not. Yay, thank you. Okay, this sounds gonna sound like super weird, but you know like that scene in Aladdin where like they're on a magic carpet and you can feel the water and like that's literally like what it feels like. You can like I can smell or I can imagine I'm smelling like ocean spray and like all of these things and it's like the seven wonders. Like that's like my favorite dream. I've had it like three times in my life and like I can vividly remember like every part of it. And that's what it is, like a magic carpet. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I love I want to have that one. 
That's good. Okay. Anybody else? I'll take one more. That's a little different. Yeah. I'd have to disagree. Uh -huh. I think that flying dreams are terrifying. Uh huh. <laughs> um, because like I'll fly and then I just fall, and then right before I hit the ground, I wake up. Then what? I wake up. Like oh, I'm then you awake. wake up. Yeah. So you like, wake I'll, up before you hit the ground, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interesting and is this recurring for you you've had it many times yeah <gasps> is it connected to anything that you know of in life you don't have to give me the exact example but is it like I've test never taking fallen or... off a cliff or anything so okay. I don't think so <laughs> but I mean is it uh does is it come before something in real life that happening like a yeah no, okay not I'm not usually. gonna do psychoanalysis <laughs> right now but see me later <laughs> All right, jokes on y'all. Flying is all about sex. We already know that. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. I hate Freud. I hate Freud. Freud's a fraud. Um, all right, so I have that dream too, and it's more like yours, both of you. Where and yours too, the magic carpet. I love that because I haven't described it as magic carpet, but yeah, that's kind of like the vibe. It's and I'm never afraid, and I'm always trying to figure out what took me so long to figure out how to do this because it's so easy and natural and cool. Um, and I have never been afraid yet, knock on wood. I mean, I really kind of, sometimes I'm thinking like, I'm due for a flying dream. Like I could really use this flying dream right now. You know, it just makes me feel really wonderful. So for those of you who are writers um, and looking for inspiration, dreams can be great. And you know how like it's, uh, they're always disconnected and weird and like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Benjamin Franklin's in it and then, <laughs> you know, you guys get married and then you <laughs> like, have you guys have ever heard of the Osmond brothers? Okay. I dreamed I went to hell with the Osmond brothers. <laughs> we were in a bus wreck. And when we all got off the bus, it was the Osmond brothers and me, and we were in hell, which kind of actually adds up, you know, but <laughs> So, but that's how dreams are. But anyway, put them on paper, not, not to analyze, but for the sequencing that doesn't make any sense and the broken narratives. I mean, that could be like just so fun just to get that, those crazy images. And then the other thing about dreams is um, one way to analyze the dream is just how, so I could dream that someone is, you know, God forbid, choking me to death. But if in the dream I'm not afraid, then it's not about someone choking me to death, you know? So you pay attention to the feeling. We, we all talked about flying. Two of you talked about ocean and water when I'm talking about flying in air. Like, where did that, I didn't ask about that, but water came in there. And one is afraid. So take that take that idea and and work it work with it in terms of the metaphor what is it saying and is flying like swimming and in what ways is it are you swimming in the ocean and in the air and just play around with it so this was my playing around with flying and it's called soft landing page 77 one one night, as I lay awake in the sweltering darkness, the stars called me back to the beginning. I went outside and gazed skyward, where Orion hung low and the Milky Way dangled within reach. A current of evolution stirred, and suddenly I was certain of my fetal wings. Pressing my bare soles against the damp ground, I angled my crooked spine and pushed up on swollen knees. I was aloft. I should have been ashamed, a tiny woman of a certain age, allowing the world to see her nethers as she soared toward the antique moon. But no. The thrill of the evening breeze lifting my thin gown only made me laugh. My center of gravity shifted. The years molted away 
like useless feathers. Circling over all that I knew, I saw the sorrows and joys blinking below me like runway lights. My slack biceps became an aileron, my calcified trunk a fuselage. The air rushed over the hump of my back, creating lift, the vertigo of natural forces, the glide of ancient impulses. It was as easy as dreaming. Night after night, I took to the air. Sometimes I could sense a ripple in the currents, the way a familiar room feels after a stranger has lingered. And then I knew I was part of an invisible flock. There were others who had remembered the time before time when we all had wings. Two, the gate for my plane was at the end of Concourse B. I made my way slowly on thick Birkenstocks, bewildered by all the rushing to nowhere. A horde of travelers parted around me, a stream flowing around a heavy stone. I arrived at my gate with 45 minutes to spare. Resting in the boarding area, I picked them out easily. They were the ones, oh, that's no, no. I picked them out easily. The splotched man with the goggle-like sunglasses who wouldn't stop tilting his face toward the sun. The woman wearing a billowy, billowy muumuu, fat flaps beneath her arms. The somber gentleman in a wheelchair with reedy legs and owl eyes. The squat woman with broad shoulders whose grandchildren ambled behind her in a V. When the plane arrived, these were the people who boarded first, all of us hollow bone creatures who required extra time. My seatmate was a twitchy man with a sharp nose and eagle black eyes. As the engines ignited, he gave me a dentured smile. An hour into the flight, I was jostled awake by the turbulence. I glanced at the man beside me, resisting the urge to grab his hand. And it was then that I noticed his feet planted on the floor, legs rigid, and I could tell he was doing the same thing I was doing, pressing his soles against the metal floor, ready to leap. When the engine spent fire over the Rockies, my heart stuttered against my rib cage. Outside of the window, the sun spilled vermilion. Behind us, a plume of dark smoke. Fasten your seatbelts and place your heads down between your knees. The women screamed, men sobbed into their hands. As the plane dove, the cabin walls groaned. Luggage shifted in the holds. Strangers united in prayer. My seatmate, however, was unafraid. Against instructions, we unfastened our seatbelts, knotted our hands together, and waited. 200 bodies thundered into the sky. The air snatched our voices. People fell like rain. But those of us who remembered threw open our arms and flew. Reactions? Got kind of dark there at the end, didn't it? Um, when you said it kind of got dark at the end, mm -hmm. I like that because it was so unexpected. Um, and I think that was a really uh, beautiful imagery that, that ended the piece. Thank you. Any other reactions? Okay, I am, um, I want to try this one. So uh, the ones that I've read you so far, for the most part, um, deal very laser focused with gender, except the last one, which is my surreal, women be free dream. Um, but a lot of my stories layer. So I hate the word intersectionality. It makes me crazy because if you've had your elementary school, you know, intersections, the Venn diagram, there's a part that has both, and then there's parts that have neither. So I am not intersectionally black and a woman. I'm completely black. <laughs> you know, it's not, not my arm. And then at this intersection, I become woman, you know, and at this intersection, I become mom. You know, it's the whole of everything. And so some of these stories, um, add that dimension uh, because race and gender can play in different ways. 
than if you're just dealing with one or the other. By the way, I always say that one of my concerns about gender is that um, it, is, it is such a constant. So I can be in rooms where I am with other African Americans or other people who've had exactly the same kind of lifestyle or experience that I've had, and my class will disappear or my race will disappear. But within that same room, um, someone will say, uh, can you go to the kitchen and, and, you know, bring back the ketchup because I'm the girl in the room, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or my kids will say, you know, where are my socks? Not to their dad, but to me, because I have ovaries and ovaries know where socks are, you know? So, you know, even at home, my children will, they all treat me like a black person at home, but my children will treat me differently as a woman, as a mother at home. The people I love the most. Um, I married and did not change my name. Um, I kept my, my birth name. And it was my parents who could not remember my name. And I always said, it's the name you gave me. <laughs> Nothing has changed here. You know, so my own parents, like they haven't called me racial slurs, but they have been really hard pressed to sometimes deal with the way I see gender. Okay, so I feel like gender gets underneath so much and it is, it is just the constant. So that is why I obsess about it. Um, so I am going to read, let me read this one, 65. It's called Ginza, in the Ginza. Um, yeah. Bobby Jean pushed the stroller through the crowded market and silently rehearsed her textbook Japanese. Ohio? Pronounced just like Ohio. For good morning. Go men? I'm sorry. Domo arigato? Lots of syllables for a simple thanks. She was elegant and chestnut skinned, her thick hair pinned in a French roll, her hands kid gloved. No one would recognize who she was beneath her polished cotton dress with sharp, sharp darts and perfect pleats. A country girl whose childhood had been crowded with big Virginia pines and even bigger dreams. She had quickly completed her mission in college to find a husband in the first year and left the backwoods town that always smelled of pig shit and sawdust. And now here she was, the wife of an airman first class raising her brand new baby in post-war Japan. Bobby Jean leaned over the sturdy pram and adjusted her daughter's pink summer blanket. It had seemed like a good idea that morning to take a stroll off base into downtown Fukuoka. But the market air was thick with dried squid and seaweed, and the push of the women with their wicker baskets made the pram feel hulking and pretentious. The Japanese Oksans never used strollers. Their babies were always lashed to their backs, even as they hunched in rice paddies. Maybe we should go home now, Bobby Jean said to the dozing child, who began to suckle the air at the sound of her mother's voice. Bobby Jean had just turned toward home when she caught the smell of roasted sweet potatoes, their syrup dripping onto hot coals. For a second, her stomach quivered, hungry for the familiar. She steered the stroller toward a group of kimonoed old women, their heads wrapped in blue and white scarves. Ichi dozo. Bobby held up a one-fingered request, bowing slightly. The women tittered toothlessly. The plump one put down her paper fan and went to claim a potato from the iron pot where they sat cooling. You, baby chan? The other woman asked, peering into the stroller. Bobby Jean moved the delicate blanket so that the women could take a peek. Her little girl had been barely six pounds at birth, and even now, three months later, she was still as fragile as porcelain, her skin pale against the tart, dark curl of her silky hair. The Japanese women drew in breaths, and Bobby smiled proudly. Indeed, her baby was beautiful. But instinct made Bobby Jean's skin prickle, as the old women kept pointing at the pram and debating. The plump one spat with finality into a tin can by her wooden chair. You, baby chan? She asked Bobby Jean again, and this time, the question felt like a cross-examination. Hi, 
said Bobby, putting her hand over her breast. My baby child. Ah, the women nodded at each other knowingly and began to discuss something again, pointing first at Bobby and then at the sleeping child. Irritated, Bobby dug into her coin purse and then held out some bronze yen coins. The women ignored her, clucking like hens. Tears began to rise instinctively, but Bobby Jean resisted the urge to back away. This wasn't the rural South, where uppityness would cost her life. This was post-war Japan, and her husband was protecting both his country and theirs. She had every right to be in the Ginza, buying a roasted sweet potato. You got GI? One of the women crept closer. Her teeth were rotted nubs, and her skin was tanned and leathery. She pointed to the baby, then back to Bobby. You got white GI? Bobby Jean stepped back, understanding the accusation. Her daughter's pale cheeks and the cat's slick hair were scarlet letters. Even here, halfway around the world, a decent colored woman was easily taken for a whore. Without answering, she paid quickly and took the warm yam. The smell was suddenly sickly sweet. Until then, Bobby Jean hadn't realized how much it reminded her of home. Reactions? What's going, what's happened in this story? When we talk about gender and race. Hello? Hold on. The Japanese are very color conscious, and they even like to go lighter. And they they are not particularly. I, I heard stories where um, the black people were there, and they had to find a uh, prostitute who would go with the black man because they were very very skin conscious. Mm -hmm. And they you know and, and I don't know if that's still the same. It was you know back a few years ago, but probably. All right, so you're stating um, you're stating a, a reality that I personally experienced. My dad was in the military in the Air Force, and I lived in Japan for a while. Um, and that was a reality there. Um, where did they get that from, the Japanese? Themselves. They are a very insular um, culture um, and xenophobic. You know, they don't like any kinds of force. That's really changing now. But um, they had, um, they just had the first black uh, Miss Japan or whatever. Like, not in the Miss Universe, but like in the Japanese world. And she was black. She's called Hafu, half, mm -hmm. because she was um, mixed race, black. So anyway, that's not the state of things necessarily now. But I do also believe that a lot of that racism was exported from the United States. It's exported in our culture. And as different cultures consume our culture, they are consuming our values, one of which is racism. Um, and so that hierarchy that's in place here is exported globally, partly. Make sure she had her makeup on very light mm -hmm. because the lighter skin proved that you weren't working in the, the patties. Absolutely. And so it's it's also um, an economic thing, too. If you're darker skinned, then you're probably poorer. Mm -hmm. And they work really hard to well, keep out of the sun. Well, let's be clear. Uh, you know, in the on, around the globe, the lighter skin is a, prefer, uh, is a preference and a privilege. And the darker skin is, you know lower class and everything. So that's a global, that's, the Japanese don't own that. <laughs> so I want to make sure, be clear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true too. Um, but here this woman is in a foreign country thinking very much that she's transcended something, you know? She's definitely where she shouldn't be, you know, if you look at the story of her own people and her own 
uh, little town and her own relatives. I mean, she's the one that got away and she is globetrotting, you know, with her soldier husband. I mean, she's she's got it made. And yet she goes into this market and the first sign of danger is she's smelling sweet potatoes, which blew me away because I didn't know that the Japanese ate a lot of sweet potatoes and they do. And they, they roast them just like they're roasted in the South and you just eat a straight sweet potato and it's not candied at Thanksgiving. It's, you know, it's a snack. And um, so she smells this and equates it with the good things about home and she's forgetting that with that also comes the racism that cannot be transcended, even by leaving the country. So, and that's, you know, still very much true today. So, um, I have another um, uh, situation that I heard about. My uh, Aquinas College roommate, I am an alum of Aquinas, for three years I lived with this uh, wonderful woman you know, in my dorm, uh, white. And she went to Japan to teach uh, English as a second language, mm -hmm. and she married uh, a Japanese architect. And what was very interesting was how, for quite a while, her in-laws not shunned her, but she wasn't the wife they really wanted for their architect. And so it was ethnic bias. Mm -hmm. And listen, it wasn't until she had the first male child that when they, they started having children, she had a boy, mm -hmm. a boy. And it was that, again, gender bias, very subtle, endemic, but there it was. And then she was like the, the golden daughter-in-law because mm -hmm. she produced a male, right. and I thought that was, and that was maybe uh, 30, 35 years ago, mm -hmm. but that was very, inter well, interesting mm -hmm. is not the word, but it, it was something to see that and to hear about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, I wanna be careful not to, um, you know, be here talking sort of us and them in terms of we are so enlightened and other countries are not, <laughs> Are not or pick on Japanese culture because I actually am hugely impacted and I love Japanese culture. Um, when I was pregnant in 1987, how many of you guys? You guys weren't even born. Um, people would come up to me. Now I didn't write a story about being pregnant and being touched. You know how your body becomes a property of the culture when you're expecting, it's no longer yours. You're bringing another human into the tribe. And so the tribe gets to just say all kinds of things and touch you and everything. But I had people say to me, oh, is this your first? And I'm like, yeah. And they said, I hope you have a boy. And so finally, by the time the third person said that, I said, because if it's a girl, I'm going to kill it. <laughs> That's what I would say to them, because I'm like, really? What is what kind of hope is that? <laughs> you know, wish me for a healthy child. You know, what are you talking about? And are we in medieval times or something? I just could not believe how many people said that. So it's hysterical. It's totally there. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go a little over my time. Is that gonna be, read one last, promise you it's this long. Um, and uh, you guys have been amazing, even though I was intimidating and got in your face and did not respect your personal space, which I'm sorry for, but I just love that engagement, and I thank you for, for playing along with me tonight. And I will be hanging around. Um, there are books out there, and I'll sign books and answer any questions that you may have that you didn't want to bring up here. So thank you, and thank you for having me. All right, so this one is called The Warrior. And what I'd like, and this is not in Know the Mother, um, listen to, it's called, uh, it's modeled after what are called definition poems, where you take um, a word and make poetry of the definition of the word. And what I'm doing here is playing with different definitions of the same word. So it's called warrior. Invalid, as in not valid, without force or foundation, indefensible. 
as in the blaze of a father's knuckles that sends a boy running into the arms of an uncle. Sam enlisted at 16 with an ID that was fake, as in fabricated or without legal merit, just like the war Sam took up looking for anyone's ass to kick. Not three weeks in Sodder City, he realized his assumptions were invalid, as in deficient in substance and cogency, weak. The sand niggers were not his enemy. They were kerchief, weepy-eyed widows and toothless old men. They were villagers abraded by dust. They were young men rotting on fence posts as children walked past on the way to school. One day, Sam made another invalid assumption. He bent to help a boy, or maybe it only seemed like a boy, since he was small and his bones were thin. And before Sam could scamper far enough away, the IED exploded. That day, Sam became a member of the disabled during active service, an invalid, as in a person who sleeps only in snatches between thunderstorms of hair and flesh and who dream of bare-knuckled fists, as in a person paralyzed by fear who doesn't know who the enemy is or when to stop fighting, as in a person without legs who can't stop running, a person without eyes who can't stop seeing. Thank you. Thank you.